The Society of the Spectacle by Guy Debord, Chapter 3, Unity and Division Within Appearances. An intense new polemic is unfolding on the philosophical front in this country, focusing on the concepts one divides into two and two fuse into one. This debate is a struggle between those who are for and those who are against the materialist, materialist dialectic, a struggle between two conceptions of the world, the proletarian conception and the bourgeois conception. Those who maintain that one divides into, into two is the fundamental law of things are on the side of the materialist dialectic. Those who maintain that the fundamental law of things is that two fuse into one are against the materialist dialectic. The two sides of or the two sides have drawn a clear line of demarcation between them and their arguments are, di are diametrically opposed. This polemic is a reflection on the ideological level of the acute and complex class struggle taking place in China and in the world. That was a quotation from Red Flag Beijing. 54. The spectacle, like modern society itself, is at once united and divided. The unity of each is based on violent divisions. But when this contradiction emerges in the spectacle, it is itself contradicted by a reversal of its meaning. The division it presents is unitary, while the unity it presents is divided. 55. Although the struggles between different powers for control of the same socio-economic system are officially presented as fundamental antagonisms, they actually reflect that system's fundamental unity both internationally and within each nation. 56. The sham spectacular struggles between rival forms of separate power are at the same time real, in that they reflect the system's uneven and conflictual development and the more or less contradictory interests of the classes or sections of classes that accept that system and strive to carve out a role for themselves within it. Just as the development of the most advanced economies involves clashes between different priorities, totalitarian state bureaucratic forms of economic management and countries under colonialism or semi-colonialism also exhibit highly divergent types of production and power. By invoking any number of different criteria, the, spe the spectacle can present these oppositions as totally distinct social systems. But in reality, they are nothing but particular sectors whose fundamental essence lies in the global system that contains them. The single movement that has turned the whole planet into its field of operation, capitalism. 57. The society that bears the spectacle does not dominate underdeveloped regions solely by its economic hegemony. It also dominates them as the society of the spectacle. Even where the material base is still absent, modern society has already used the spectacle to invade the social surface of every continent. It sets the stage for the formation of indigenous ruling classes and frames their agendas. Just as it presents pseudo goods to be coveted, it offers false models of revolution to local revolutionaries. The bureaucratic regimes in power in certain industrialized countries have their own particular type of spectacle but it is an integral part of the total spectacle, serving as its pseudo-opposition and actual support. Even if local manifestations of the spectacle include certain totalitarian specializations of social communication and control, from the standpoint of the overall functioning of the system, those specializations are simply playing their allotted role within a global division of spectacular tasks. 58. Although this division of spectacular tasks preserves the exi existing order as a whole, it is primarily oriented toward protecting its dominant pole of development. The spectacle is rooted in the economy of abundance, and the products of that economy ultimately tend to dominate the spectacular market and override the ideological or police state protection protectionist barriers set up by local spectacles with pretensions of independence. 59. Behind the glitter of spectacular distractions, a tendency toward banalization dominates modern society the world over. 
Even where the more advanced forms of commodity consumption have seemingly multiplied, the variety of roles and objects to choose from. The vestiges of religion and of the family, the latter is still the primary mechanism for transferring class power from one generation to the next, along with the vestiges of moral repression imposed by those two institutions, can be blended with ostentatious pretensions of worldly gratification, precisely because life in this particular world remains repressive and offers nothing but pseudo gratifications. Complacent acceptance of the status quo may also coexist with purely spectacular rebelliousness. Dissatisfaction itself becomes a commodity as soon as the economy of abundance develops the capacity to process that particular raw material. 60. Stars, spectacular representations of living human beings, project this general banality into images of permitted roles. As specialists of apparent life, stars serve as superficial objects that people can identify with in order to compensate for the fragmented productive specializations that they actually live. The function of these celebrities is to act out various lifestyles or socio-political viewpoints in a full, totally free manner. They embody the inaccessible results of social labor by dramatizing the byproducts of that labor, which are magically projected above it as its ultimate goals, power and vocations, the decision-making and consumption that are at the beginning and the end of a process that is never questioned. On one hand, a governmental power may personalize itself as a pseudo star. On the other, a star of consumption may campaign for recognition as a pseudo power over life. But the activities of these stars are not really free and they offer no real choices. 61. The agent of the spectacle who is put on stage as a star is the opposite of an individual. He is as clearly the enemy of his own individuality as of the individuality of others. Entering the spectacle as a model to be identified with, he renounces all autonomous qualities in order to identify himself with the general law of obedience to the flow of things. The stars of consumption, though outwardly representing different personality types, show each of these types enjoying equal access to and deriving equal happiness from the entire realm of consumption. The stars of decision-making must possess the full range of admired human qualities. Official differences between them are thus cancelled out by the official similarity implied by their supposed excellence and every field of endeavor. As head of state, Khrushchev retrospectively became a general so as to take credit for the victory of the Battle of Kursk 20 years after it happened, and Kennedy survived as an orator to the point of delivering his own funeral oration, since Theodore Sorensen continued to write speeches for his successor in the same style that had contributed, to much, contributed so much toward the dead man's public persona. The admirable people who personify the system are well known for not being what they seem. They attain greatness by stooping below the reality of the most insignificant individual life, and everyone knows it. 62. The false choices offered by spectacular abundance, choices based on the juxtaposition of competing yet mutually reinforcing spectacles, and of distinct yet interconnected roles, signified and embodied primarily by objects, develop into struggles between illusory qualities designed to generate fervent allegiance to quantitative trivialities. Fallacious archaic oppositions are revived. Regionalisms and racisms, which serve to endow mundane rankings in the hierarchies of consumption with a magical ontological su superiority, and subplayful enthusiasms are aroused by an endless succession of farcical competitions from sports to elections. Wherever abundant consumption is established, one particular spectacular opposition is always in the forefront of illusory roles, the antagonism between youth and adults. But real adults, people who are masters of their own lives, are in fact nowhere to be found and a youthful transformation of what exists is in no way characteristic of those who are now young. It is present solely in the economic system, in the dynamism of capitalism. It is things that rule and that are young. 
vying with each other and constantly replacing each other. 63. Spectacular oppositions conceal the unity of poverty. If different forms of the same alienation struggle against each other in the guise of irreconcilable antagonisms, this is because they are all based on real contradictions that are, that are repressed. The spectacle exists in a concentrated form or a diffuse form, depending on the requirements of the particular stage of poverty it denies and supports. In both cases, it is nothing more than an image of happy harmony surrounded by desolation and horror at the calm center of misery. 64. The concentrated spectacle is primarily associated with bureaucratic capitalism, though it may also be imported as a technique for reinforcing state power in more backward, mixed economies, or even adopted by advanced capitalism during certain moments of crisis. Bureaucratic property is itself concentrated in that the individual bureaucrat takes part in the ownership of the entire economy only through his membership in the community of bureaucrats. And since commodity production is less developed under bureaucratic capitalism, it too takes on a concentrated form. The commodity the bureaucracy appropriates is the total social labor, and what it sells back to the society is that society's wholesale survival. The dictatorship of the bureaucratic economy cannot leave the exploited masses any significant margin of choice because it is it is had to make all the choices itself and any choice made independently of it whether regarding food or music or anything else thus amounts to a declaration of war against it this dictatorship must be enforced by permanent violence its spectacle imposes an image of the good which subsumes everything that officially exists, an image which is usually concentrated in a single individual, the guarantor of the system's totalitarian cohesion. Everyone must magically identify with this absolute star or disappear. This master of everyone else's non-consumption is the heroic image that disguises the absolute exploitation entailed by the system of primitive accumulation accelerated by terror if the entire Chinese population has to study Mao to the point of identifying with Mao, this is because there is nothing else they can be. The concentrated spectacle implies a police state. 65. The diffuse spectacle is associated with commodity abundance, with the undisturbed development of modern capitalism. Here, each individual commodity is justified in the name of the grandeur of the total commodity production, of which the spectacle is a laudatory catalogue. Irreconcilable claims jockey for position on the stage of the affluent economy's unified spectacle, and different star commodities simultaneously promote conflicting social policies. The automobile spectacle, for example, strives for a perfect traffic flow entailing the the destruction of old urban districts, while the city spectacle needs to preserve those districts as tourist attractions. The already dubious satisfaction alleged to be obtained from the consumption of the whole is thus constantly being disappointed because the actual consumer can directly access only a succession of fragments of this commodity heaven, fragments which invariably lack the quality attributed to the whole. 66. Each individual commodity fights for itself. It avoids acknowledging the others and strives to impose itself everywhere as if it were the only one in existence. The spectacle is the epic poem of this struggle, a struggle that no fall of Troy can bring to an end. The spectacle does not sing of men and their arms, but of commodities and their passions. In this bl blind struggle, each commodity, by pursuing its own passion, unconsciously generates something beyond itself. The globalization of the commodity, which also amounts to the commodification of the globe. Thus, as a result of the cunning of the commodity, while each particular manifestation of the commodity eventually falls in battle, the general commodity form continues onward toward its absolute realization. 67. The satisfaction that no longer comes from using the commodities produced in abundance is now sought through recognition of their value as commodities. Consumers are filled with religious fervor for the 
for the sovereign freedom of commodities, whose use has become an end in itself. Waves of enthusiasm for particular products are propagated by all the communications media. A film sparks a fashion craze. A magazine publicizes night spots, which in turn spin off different lines of products. The proliferation of faddish gadgets reflects the facts, or the fact that as the mass of commodities becomes increasingly absurd, absurdity itself becomes a commodity. Trinkets such as keychains, which come as free bonuses with the purchase of some luxury product, but which end up being traded back and forth as valued collectibles in their own right, reflect a mystical self-abandonment commodity transcendence. Those who collect the trinkets that have been manufactured for the sole purpose of being collected are accumulating commodity indulgences, glorious tokens of the commodity's real presence among the faithful. Reified people proudly display the proofs of their int intimacy with the commodity, like the old religious fetishism with its convulsionary raptures and miraculous cures. The fetishism of commodities generates its own moments of fervent arousal. All this is useful for only one purpose, producing habitual submission. 68. The pseudo needs imposed by modern consumerism cannot be contrasted with any genuine needs or desires that are not themselves also shaped by this society and its history. Commodity abundance represents a total break in the organic development of social needs. Its mechanical accumulation unleashes an unlimited artificiality, which overpowers any living desires. The cumulative power of this autonomous artificiality ends up by falsifying all social life. 69. The image of blissful social unification through consumption merely postpones the consumer's awareness of the actual divisions until his next disillusionment with some particular commodity. Each new product is ceremoniously acclaimed as a unique creation, offering a dramatic shortcut to the promised land of total consummation. But as with the fashionable adoption of seemingly aristocratic first names, which end up being given to virtually all individuals of the same age, the objects that promise uniqueness can be offered up for mass consumption only if they are numerous enough to have been mass produced. The prestigiousness of mediocre objects of this kind is solely due to the fact that they have been placed, however briefly, at the center of social life and hailed as a revelation of the unfathomable purposes of production. But the object that was prestigious in the spectacle becomes mundane as soon as it is taken home by its consumer, at the same time as by all its other consumers. Too late it reveals its essential poverty poverty that inevitably reflects the poverty of its production. Meanwhile, some other object is already replacing it as justification of the system and demanding its own moment of acclaim. 70. The fraudulence of the satisfactions offered by the system is exposed by the continual replacement of products and of general conditions of production. In both the, diffu in both the diffuse and the concentrated spectacle, Entities that have brazenly asserted their definitive perfection nevertheless end up changing, and only the system endures. Stalin, like any other outmoded commodity, is denounced by the very forces that originally promoted him. Each new lie of the advertising industry is an admission of its previous lie. And with each downfall of a personification of totalitarian power, the illusory community that had unanimously approved him is exposed as a mere conglomeration of loners without illusions. 71. The things the spectacle presents as eternal are based on change and must change as their foundations change. The spectacle is totally dogmatic, yet it is incapable of arriving at any real solid dogma. Nothing stands still for it. This instability is the spectacle's natural condition but it is completely contrary to its natural inclination. 72. The unreal unity proclaimed by the spectacle masks the class division underlying the real unity of the, class, uh, of the capitalist mode of production. What obliges the producers to participate in the construction of the world is also what excludes them from it. What brings people into relation with each other by liberating them from their local and national limitations is also what keeps them apart. 
but requires increased rationality is also what nourishes the irrationality of hierarchical exploitation and repression. What produces society's abstract power also produces its concrete lack of freedom.